Uh, good morning. Hi, I'm Phil Seifert. I'm the Director of Alliances and Strategic Partners at CyberCX, and thank you for joining us today at um, our Cyber Dialogue. Uh, this is number nine. What does SASE bring to the cyber party? Um, you know, you're joining, uh, you're joining a lot of peers in the industry uh, today, and uh, we really appreciate you taking the time to learn more. This is an opportunity to be a, a bit of education, uh, a bit of uh, industry and customer view on, on a very topical uh, subject. Um, today is sponsored by um, uh, CyberCX. You know, we're just a reminder, and for those who don't know, you know CyberCX is a, a group of very well-known, you know, independent uh, cybersecurity firms that we've brought together into a single workforce um, that deliver an end-to-end an, an -end suite of cybersecurity services, you know, to our customers across Australia and New Zealand. So um, I'd like to set up, you know, today a little bit. This is a really interesting topic, and and uh, you know, we refer to uh, uh, Gartner. They've they've established this term, SASE. Um, and, and I've asked some individuals that with a, a lot of knowledge on this and, and investment in particular from the industry going into uh, what SASE is, what it brings to, to customers, what it will uh, deliver and some of the challenges um, that it is, uh, um, you know, overcoming. Um, there's been a great deal of activity in this space from an investment perspective. Um, you know, we've seen just back in February, McAfee acquiring Lightpoint Security. Another acquisition is, you know, uh, industry, you know, leader Palo, Palo Alto Networks um, acquiring Cloudgenix. Uh, you know, HPE recently just spending a billion dollars US on Silver Peak and Fortinet just this last week acquiring a cloud security and network innovator, Opaque Networks to build their SASE platforms and to fill out the capability. Now this goes in line with the investments that all of these businesses are making in R&D in developing the framework and, and the um, outcomes to customers, as well as the vendor alignment, which we've seen from, again, Palo, Zscaler, Cato Networks, Cisco, Juniper, VMware, Forcepoint, and Fortinet, all aligning to the SASE framework. So this actually supports, I think, what we're, what Gartner is predicting that 40% in the year 2024, 40% of enterprises and organizations will have a strategy to adopt this SASE framework. And, and that's up from just 1% today. And, and so today, really what we'd like to do is take you through an agenda and, and actually you know, discuss this with some industry experts on, on what it is that this uh, framework is going to bring to us. So our agenda for this morning, um, I'll introduce our panelists in a moment. Um, they're going to bring us a, a customer and an industry perspective. We'll take us through the benefits, use, and risk of, of a SASE environment. Um, we have some questions that we've received in advance. And at the end, please you know, uh, start to collect your questions, and we'll ask you to um, add your questions into, the, uh, into that, that questions area of the uh, GoToWebinar control panel. So, well, you know, our next step, if you would, if you'd... Um, Actually, uh, join me in thanking uh, uh, as well. Sean Duca is the Vice President and Regional Chief Security Officer for APAC for Palo Alto Networks, who joins us with you know a number of years' experience, and he's taking the the industry's view and how are they responding and some of the names that we've talked about to you know Gartner's um, you know uh, 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 adopting a, a framework, a new framework or a hype cycle that we'll all be involved with, and then from a customer view. I've asked Mark Hoffman to join us. He's the Chief Technology Officer at CyberCX. So uh, uh, welcome to you both. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Um, now we are, um, you know, we're, we're located, you know, here in the uh, uh, in, in the Shearwater uh, studio here in uh, downtown, uh, downtown Chatswood. Um, I'm at a safe COVID distance from, uh, from Mark Hoffman. Sean, where are you joining us from? Uh, from McMahon's Point at the moment. In your in the studio in McMahon's Point again, another uh, COVID safe location. Again, uh, I think like last week or last last uh, our our thoughts and um, uh, go out to those you know in Victoria who are really you know challenged by uh, this uh, this pandemic. But let's jump into uh, a, a you know a customer lens if we could. I'm I'm going to ask Mark to to really kick off for us here and tell us you know over the last five years you know you're you're an industry veteran. You've been working with Shearwater for a number of years. I won't count those years. So if we could just go back five years 
and give us a perspective. What are some of the bigger changes that you've seen in, in your customer security team in an organization that they've been faced with? Five years, ancient history in cybersecurity terms, I guess. Um, <laughs> so so thank, thanks for that. So yes, looking, looking at where we were five years ago and where we are today, uh, there is a uh, quite a big difference between it. Uh, I mean, security teams have been shrinking. We've been asked to do more with, with less. Um, but also a lot of security teams or organisations have started to realise that, uh, you know, the environment they're working in is much more complex than initially um, determined. And, and of course, we're all moving workloads to cloud. Some organisation, it was a little bit of a surprise. Hey, we're moving everything to cloud. Other organisations, it was more, much more of a, a strategy, to a strategic move to do that. From a security perspective, that obviously gives you a few different challenges. Um, and we, we've kind of been on about this for years now, with that uh, protection needs to shift from perimeters to actually protecting the data where it is, regardless of where it is. And uh, you know, when we're moving towards the SASE platform, that's probably going to be one of the ways in which we can actually uh, achieve that. And we didn't have the tools available either. So five years ago, if, if we were, uh, having this conversation, it, we'd probably be sitting around a table scratching our heads to see what we're going to do. So there's, there's many more, there's much more capability available uh, right now. So that increased complexity, you know, the, the hybrid environments of having on-premises as well as cloud uh, requirements, that, that's certainly a big change today. And of course, we can't ignore the elephant in the room. Um, you know, five years ago, if you had 10% of your workforce remote, working remotely, you were probably probably considered a hugely progressive organization and uh, uh, quite ahead of the, uh, ahead of your uh, time. Whereas nowadays I suspect that most of us on the call are working from home uh, and most of your workforce will be working from home as well. So that's obviously a vast uh, shift as well. So that's, that's something that we've had to come to terms with. So the, the, the challenges that uh, security teams and organization face is obviously providing that similar experience that people have in the office to now providing that same experience from home. And uh, one of the challenges from a technical perspective is that the, you know, the, the more traditional methods uh, are funneling all of the traffic back to head office and then funneling it back out again. So even though you're potentially using a cloud service, you're actually you know, heading into the office first and then to go back out again. Okay. so. Um... It, what, what, I, what I heard you say is, is obviously things are accelerating mm. um, and, and what's causing that is not just the pandemic, but there's that shift to the cloud is clearly what I think industry has responded to, you know, with their acquisitions and, it's, and um, it's and, moving, it's and, protecting and, and, and that data. It's protecting right. the data rather than what we used to do, which is basically ring fence all of our, our crown jewels. You know, now we're shifting those crown jewels to other locations, including cloud locations. So we need to start protecting the crown jewels where they are, as opposed to try and essentially circle the wagons. Good. And and now today, if we shift today, we move from five years ago to today. You now you you meet with customers regularly. You're consulting mm. with them. You know, what are you hearing most often that uh, the challenges that we can help them, you know, we can help solve. So the challenges many organisations have it's it is that uh, resourcing capability. Um, a few years ago, you know, and even now, you see organisations that have the security strategy side very well sorted out, or they have the operations side very well sorted out. So getting both sorted out and and resourced. Uh, is a challenge for many organisations and you don't often see that in the same team. If yours is one of them, fantastic. Uh, but, you know, the realisation that you need the strategy, you need the operation and capability, especially the, the response capability, but also the, the security hygiene tasks that need to happen in any organisation. They need to be resourced, they need to be managed. So I think that's one big challenge. Um, and then, you know, data moving around. I mean, whenever we go into an organization and uh, talk to them about, you know, where are your crown jewels, et cetera. In fact, one of the instant responses that we worked in the, in the past couple of months, you know, one of the first tasks is where are all your assets? And it took quite a bit of effort to figure out exactly where everything was, whether it was inside the organization or in cloud locations, or in fact, in people's homes. Thank you. I appreciate that. Now let's, um, let's, let's ask, 
um, Sean to join us. And, and I think we're going to shift now. We've, we've talked about what, what customers are faced with both in the past, the, the rapid change that they've mm. had to adopt, that balance between security operations and security strategy. And let's move to, you know, the, help us educate us a bit here, if you would, Sean, on, on the SASE framework. Yeah, SASE is uh, really used uh, to deliver, I guess, that convergence between uh, enterprise networking and security services and doing it from a global distributed cloud service. Uh, the way that SASE really sort of overcomes, uh, or I guess SASE overcomes the cost complexity and pretty much that the way that we've always had these disparate different security solutions and really ties it together. Uh, rather than being sort of in dis uh, disparate solutions, it's something that's natively integrated there and working in the cloud the way that it should be working. Uh, when you start to add, I guess, the the global context around it, that's when you can start to look at ways of addressing when, uh, the way that you start to address uh, connectivity to uh, cloud services uh, and really leveraging, I guess, the speed and agility of, of the cloud. Thanks very much. Would you take us through this slide? Because I think you, you make the point here, um, again, rapid adoption, rapid change that is occurring you know, what's driving, you know, what's driving the, the requirement, you know, as an industry, you, you know, as a group, you've, you've responded with a lot of investment. You know, what are you experiencing that you saw pre-pandemic that you started to make those investments and, uh, and, and find that roadmap for the, the strategy? Yeah, look, a lot of the key pieces, especially around sort of just echoing a lot of the sentiments that uh, Mark called out earlier, it's really around how do we bring uh, how do we look at what people are actually doing today? And if you think about the top five applications, maybe even the top 10 applications that people are typically using inside their own organization are probably sitting out in public cloud infrastructure. Uh, they may be consumed as software as a service. So you've now got these data islands that are sitting outside of kind of the, 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 that sort of hard, chunky uh, piece inside your own corporate environment. Uh, so you've already got the data that sh sh sits out there. So rather than actually trying to send data back into your own corporate environment, backhauling that traffic and then sending it back out again. It's more around how do we start to just be a little bit more intelligent around, you know, directing where the traffic should go. Uh, but then when you start to add, I guess, the, the network layer and the security layer together and really drive that through the cloud, that's where you really start to think about how do I get some real scale and leverage by, uh, you know, really starting to think about where is my data going and let's control that, but let's actually apply both the networking and the security aspect, rather than seeing that as two separate groups or two separate uh, uh, layers altogether. Thanks very much. Now let's go to the next question, if I could, and I'll open this up. You know, I'd like a perspective from both. But, but Sean, if you start off, what what do you think prompted Gartner to identify and classify this as 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 a SASE enabled you know framework? Yeah, so Gartner really sees it as as more and more businesses are really starting to leverage. Um, you know, digital channels, they're looking at things such as edge computing and really the way that we have, uh, I guess, transforms the way that we operate, uh, whether it be at sort of at the campus, the branch level, or even as remote users. You know, we're seeing more and more people that are out there and connected. You know, case in point, look at all of us uh, over the last 20 or so weeks. Uh, we've got all these different mobile devices, mobile users that are actually out there. The applications that we keep on building, the applications that we keep on leveraging, are outside typically of that sort of traditional sort of corporate environment or corporate corporate uh, um, you know enterprise that's actually in there and they're now sort of started to shift out so the, the real crux of it is how do we start to secure what everything has now been pushed out even further out to the edge and that's where really we need to think about how do we manage uh, the security elements around that uh, start to leverage cloud the way that it should be but start to think about it more around how do we securely enable all those applications um, to be accessed irrespective of what network, what device they're actually on. And it's really driven around that sort of the user. You know, think about it today. We've always had the concept of people going to work. Now we need to be thinking about how do we deliver work to people? And that's where SASE really comes into it because it's focusing on the individual or the people themselves. Yeah, I, I don't know if it was one of Gartner's motivations to, to create uh, this category, I guess, but the the, uh, the point that you make about people shifting their workloads to cloud that's certainly uh, a base element but also the the protection of that and i mean you know the, the question of how do i protect my data regardless of where it is um, we've been kind of trying to work that out sensibly for for a few years now 
So this is kind of a, a good step towards that. Look, I'd be curious from both of you. I mean, Gartner's hype cycle, their waves, their technology waves are, are well regarded in the industry. They're used by the industry to, uh, you know, to justify, you know, a, 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 an investment, you know, in organizations. Um, from a from a customer in an industry, how important it is it to to have been defined a, a, a Gartner quadrant? Let me ask Mark first from a from a customer perspective. Does it help? build the business case when they can use that um, you know, for investment to the back to the business? I, th I think if I put a customer hat on, mm -hmm. like a pure customer hat, and you look at Gartner to provide you with some guidance on whether the way that you're thinking is actually the way that you should be thinking. So, so uh, you know, the, 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 the statement used to be, you know, nobody ever got fired for buying IBM, et cetera. So, and certainly nobody uh, is necessarily going to get fired for doing what Gartner suggests they do. But yeah, that, that's a little bit flippant, I know. But in reality, they do do their research generally quite well. Uh, they do bring things together. The reason for this category coming together is, is probably because the the convergence of the tools as well into one, right? Because a lot of the capabilities of, of what you need in the SASE, the zero trust, the, the the web gateways, the the identity management components, the remote access components, they all exist, but they exist as disparate components that you have to, as an organization, kludge together in order to get something to work. Whereas this category is more aligned towards, you know, converging that whole capability into one tool set that you can then start consuming and ideally in a few years time, uh, if not now, start consuming as a service rather than a I'm buying product ABC, which I'm gonna have to deploy. They all give me this SASE capability. I'm clicking a button on a AWS marketplace or an Azure marketplace or a Google marketplace and here's my service, here's my networking, everything's done. So what I'm hearing from you is customers would use the the Gartner framework or Gartner guidance mm. as as just validating a strategy that they may have been on. Yeah, absolutely, right. absolutely. Yeah, uh, I, right. you know, many of uh, the people listening, they would have been thinking along these lines as anyway. They'd be trying to look at at how am I going to solve this problem, uh, and I looked at this and went, oh, actually, this is probably going to get me most of the way there. All right. Uh, so yeah. Thank you. Hey, uh, John, you know, in the, um, you know, Gartner came out with this in about August 2019. Um, how did it resonate inside of, of Palo Alto? You, you, you know, Palo was a, a clear leader in this. They were the first to really align to it. You know, did it, did it resonate in, inside the, you know, inside headquarters in San Francisco? Yeah, look, absolutely it did. So when, when Gartner came out with, um, I guess the, the four requirements, so to speak, of what makes up a SASE vendor. And that's really around sort of the convergence of the WAN edge and the network security models, uh, being a cloud native or a cloud-based delivered um, service, um, you know, network design for all edges, and then identity and network location. So those four key requirements for us, it, it definitely resonated with us because that was really the, I call it the, the genesis of what we thought about at Palter Networks. You know, we always believe that you need to tie the user with the application and the content. Uh, when people were, and, and whilst we sort of were born out of that sort of next generation file physical boxes, um, you know, as people started to move into private data centers, you know, we followed VMware into sort of those uh, virtual data centers and then in turn out into public cloud infrastructure. So we really understand the concepts of a concept of being cloud native, built for the cloud, scaling out with the cloud, uh, but then obviously from that identity, the the convergence of all those different pieces, you know, that for us really resonated to what we've always believed in. Uh, and it really allowed us to be called uh, a, a pure place sort of SASE vendor from the word go. And then obviously from there, we started to see some further acquisitions take place, really just to bolster the capability that we've actually got in the platform uh, and really sort of take to market that pure 100% cloud native, cloud delivered service uh, with more than 100 points of presence around the world, leveraging, you know, the expensive uh, private backbones of all those uh, cloud service providers that are out there. And and just just to add one more thing to that as well, Sean, uh, is that 
you know, as a, a security professional, you know, it's it's often quite irritating that tools just don't work together. And this is yeah. to me kind of one of the nice points where this is one category where finally things are actually starting to work together without being labeled a firewall, a web gateway, a something else. You know, this is a, a cohesive something. Totally. And look, it's, and it's even to the point that you mentioned earlier, Mark, like with the, where these are the capabilities that you either probably have today that may actually be disparate solutions. It's just more about how do we actually bring all of that together? Mm. Because at the end of the day, I think we've learned that, you know, having 25 different solutions because we probably needed to, uh, to solve some of the challenges we've got and obviously have some capability gaps, but it's how do we actually make our life a little bit easier from that sort of the management side of it, solving some of those other challenges. And, and people may actually not even be thinking about, you know, I, I need to solve a data loss issue today because I'm not that mature as an organization as part of my security program, but tomorrow I do. Great, SASE enables you to have that sort of one platform that you can simply turn something on rather than buying get out of the console, you know, the management, you know, another solution, get out of the management console to bring it all together, bring it all together. Thanks, Sean. Let's go on to the next question, which, you know, you've done, both of you have done a great job at, at probably uh, picking up a lot of the benefits. Um, you know, let's get a little technical here. And, um, you know, as we've talked about, it's, it's the convergence of the security and the networking. We haven't spoken about the networking in particular. What are the risks and challenges and what does it really improve on a technical level? What security does it does it improve? Sean, I'll, I'll, I'll hand over to you to, to respond first. Yeah, in terms of, I guess, what does it improve for a security organization? The, the big thing that for me that really stands out, and let's just say there's, you know, 15 individual pieces that really sort of make up SASE. Um, if you have 15 individual products to try and solve uh, that capability, automatically you've got complexity. And as I think as we've seen over the years, complexity is the, the root of all security programs that are actually out there or the probably the root of all evil, if anything. Um, so you've got that challenge. So you've got a bit of a management overhead. Uh, and I think that's one of the benefits that you're really gonna get out of it. The risks, uh, by sort of bringing all of these capabilities in having a natively integrated platform to really sort of solve that, I think that's how you can start to, um, you know, provide a better security outcome, lower the risk for an organization. Uh, but at the same time, you think about how it actually improves the um, security for an organization. The bigger challenge is probably going to be that some people probably don't even have some of the ability to solve some of these security challenges today or some of the challenges today that SASE can actually offer and deliver. You know, a great one that probably sticks out to me is around zero trust. You know, it's zero trust is something that's been talked about for a number of years. You know, Forrester, uh, John Kindervark actually came out with it in um, sort of mid 2000s or I think it was about 2010. And you think about it at that point, you know, John was really talking about zero trust and what it really means of how do you bring the identity and the inspection of the applications, controlling all of that together, logging all the information. You know, only now, 10 years later, that people are really starting to adopt and apply this. And that's the, I guess, the improvement to an organization. They can easily start to leverage zero trust from a cloud delivered security service and it's something they can actually start to do today uh, whilst we've been talking about it for 10 years. Thank you. And, and Mark? So going towards the risk and challenges, I, I think that with a SASE type deployment, there is a chance that you're going to be missing things. So there's going to be outliers. Every organization has legacy systems that they can't do much with. Um, I was talking to a customer this morning, they're, they're, you know, they're still running Solaris 5. So, you know, that's that's not necessarily something that you can uh, easily secure or fold into, <coughs> excuse me, this kind of uh, platform. So I think that's going to be a challenge going forwards is, is that, yes, you can deploy this for 90% of what you do, but you need to deal with the 10% that's left over. Uh, so that's going to be a risk, obviously, and it's also going to be a challenge. Um, so yeah, that's the main things I'd say. Thank you. And let's let's go on to the next question just before the poll. Um, I, I, Sean, uh, you know, you, uh, Paulo's been uh, successful in in providing a you know a, a SASE enabled service, Prisma Access, uh, to customers. You know, what's the size of organization that's that's had the best uptake? Is there a segment that that really stands out for you in terms of being successful with it? Uh, look, to, to be honest, I think if I definitely sort of look at the last, uh, let's just say at the start of uh, COVID, uh, you know, and even before that, we had, um, you know, hundreds of customers that were really sort of leveraging the SASE capability of what we had. At the start of COVID, we helped, um, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of core organizations since then, 
uh, really leveraging the capability that we've actually got. And the, the range of sizes has been everything from, you know, a, a couple of thousand or even sort of a thousand employees um, all the way up to over a hundred thousand people uh, in one organization that were able to get up and running in less than 24 hours. Uh, and that's really around that sort of mass migration of how do we deal with a 100% remote workforce that we had to sort of stand up overnight some 23, 22 weeks ago now. Um, so it really does scale up and down. Um, and there's kind of not, you know, this is the particular segment, it's only the top end of town. It does actually sort of scale down as well. And so in the Australian context, or the Australian market, those typical size organisations, it worked perfectly. So, so some of the organisations that I think it suits or it might suit is uh, those with uh, traditionally quite flat networks that, that don't have a lot of uh, control with inside their own environment. Um, you know, this kind of model would help them uh, protect those, those networks, you know, a lot better without having to, for example, re-architect uh, their actual physical topology. Uh, I think that would be a big benefit there. Okay, thank you very much. Let's um, stop, and I'll um, you know we'll ask our um, our listeners now if they would um, you know to respond to the poll, and um, we just like to get a sense of you know what, what's the level of education and knowledge. Um, you should have that poll on your screen, um, and we just like to understand you know what is your knowledge of uh, of the SASE framework and the model. Um, you wrote the book on, on SASE. You're an expert. We want to talk to you. <laughs> um, you know you're you're comfortable with the model and the technology. You're, you're starting to have some plans around it. Um, you're upskilling, you're learning and, and using this as part of your education to, to learn more or, you know, um, this is this is your initial introduction into the framework and, and what it does. If you would, uh, I'll give you a few minutes or a few seconds here just to respond. It should be a quick answer. Don't think about too much. And we'll move on to the uh, to the next question. We'll respond and we'll give you the, the, re the results of the poll at the end. So we're back in. Um, it's you know it's, it's as an organization you may have defined you know well, what's what's our what's our path what you know we're, we're going to move towards this it is going to enable us reduce our complexity therefore cost we'll get the balance right between security operations and strategy um, and we can really start to attack it you know and, and building our security um, posture with the, with our applications that are in the cloud and where they reside. Or I think to, to Sean's point, which I really liked, is you know it's how do we deliver you know the work to the people versus the other way around. So um, Sean, what do you, what's required? What's what's been your experience with customers required to transition to SASE? You know both for the security and the network team, but then also is there any cultural or or te technology change that the organization has to adopt? Yeah, look, it's 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 a good question. I, I think many times, if you think about what, I guess going back to some of the previous statements, you know, SAS is all about converging uh, and leveraging sort of a cloud native capability uh, that solves a couple of those key challenges that maybe the solutions that we use as point product solutions today, and that could be, you know, an SD-WAN solution, next-gen firewall, secure web gateway, VPN capability, that really requires us to have a very clear understanding of the size, the scale of what is that we actually need to implement today and then start to work out how does this actually grow over the, the coming years. Uh, when you start to think about SASE, it's one of those things that we can easily dial up um, and use by some sort of a surge ability to say, okay, let's actually quickly get everyone working remotely again. You know, let's just say for argument's sake, touch wood, you know, COVID-20 was to come out or there was going to be another spike. We can literally dial this up and you don't have to think about or have that foresight into how do I now scale up this infrastructure? So if you think about the changes that are there, it really just requires you to say, do I need to have these particular capabilities first, second, third? Uh, and that really is going to be predicated on, I need to have the understanding of the identity of the user. So that could be any active, that could be an active directory source, any sort of directory source that's in there. And then I start to have that granular ability where I can look at the applications, what users can do, who, what they can actually access, and really controlling that and dial it up and down. So I think for the benefit that a security team and a network team, um, I guess, get is that one platform that could solve a lot of these challenges. In terms of what's requiring to transition, uh, the big thing that I probably would say is um, turn it on and, and start to see what extra capabilities you're going to get. And the first thing, first and foremost, I'd say is you're just going to probably end up getting visibility. More times than not, people 
will probably say that they, they know what applications are actually being used by their organization today, in particular those software as a service applications. The reality is they actually can't tell you. And I think SASE is gonna be one of those things that they're gonna be able to see pretty much straight away and then start to control and start to put some sort of policies in place as to what people can or can't do. And the beauty of it is being a cloud-based solution, you can turn it on and off as when needed. So, so I kind of looked at this a little bit differently. Uh, I must confess at that particular question. So the, the you know the changes for the security team and the networking team, they're, they're going to start converging slightly. They're, they're going to have to get you know to be better friends. Uh, and we're kind of talking about this yesterday. You know, I can always tell. You know, I can generally tell when a firewall, for example, is being configured by a security person or a networking team member, uh, because there, there's different objectives to get things going. So I think there's going to be a little bit of a shift in thinking there. The other thing that I think as security people you're going to have to get used to, and in my house we call this the frozen approach. So sometimes you're just going to have to let it go. Um, yeah, and and in this particular environment you're going to have to let it go that that the perimeter is the the hard and hard and fast boundary between where things can happen and where things can't happen. So so that's the thing that you're going to have to let go and uh, and understand and kind of trust the tooling that it's going to do what it needs to do. Now obviously you need to to take your own steps to make sure that you know you're comfortable with what it's going to do, but that's one of the things that's going to happen. From a change within the organization, a cultural change within the organization, I suspect not as much. Um, a lot of the solutions that we're doing for end users, for example, they are relatively seamless and, and a lot of them are not necessarily noticing too much, but I can see that this kind of approach would make it even more seamless for them and they you know, typically have to worry less about doing things differently from remote as opposed to the office. I think that's going to be an advantage as well. So as for the transition to SASE, you're just going to have to take baby steps and, and <clears throat> excuse me, build yourself out a roadmap of where you are now and, and where you want to go. And then as Sean says, you know, switch it on, see what the benefits are, what things you can actually get out of it quickly. Switch it on. Now, is uh, Sean, is this something that is um, fairly easy or, you know, a less challenge to, to run a POC, to run a, a proof of value, uh, you know, um, test? We would actually encourage it, if anything, um, you know, test it in your own environment, see what's there. Don't sort of rely on sort of the, the brochureware or anything like that. Uh, put it through its paces, see how it actually would operate in your own environment. Because uh, the big thing is it's all about delivering uh, that sort of, you know, better sort of customer experience or, or user experience that's actually there. You want to see how quickly you'd be able to get access to some of your key applications you're actually using out as, uh, as, as cloud sort of delivered services, those software as a service. So turn it on. Uh, you know, and really sort of put it through its paces. I, I can certainly echo that. Uh, with, within our own uh, company, with, within Shearwater, um, I switched on the CASB component to, oh, probably a month or two ago. And the number of applications that I didn't know people were running uh, on their machines is actually quite staggering. Yep. <laughs> and, and, and now they run what we want them to run as opposed to uh, other things that might be there. So so the uh, visibility piece for me uh, with my uh, paranoid security hat on uh, has been quite staggering. Okay, so that's, that's that runs directly in, in you know, a contradiction to the let it go frozen Disney. Yeah, approach. absolutely. I don't, don't, don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong. I, I, I'm a control freak and I will confess to anyone that I'm a control freak. <laughs> But I'm I'm letting it go, as in I now have visibility, therefore I can let it go. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, there we go. Let's, let's get the T-shirt. Let it go. Frozen yeah. is is now a new security term. We'll Frozen go. is now the security manager. Yeah. Thank you. Very good. Um, look, let's let's go on to the next uh, the next question because um, you know, Sean, your Palo Alto Networks is a very good company. Um, there are, you know, a number of, of you know, large uh, competitors in this space. I've mentioned a few Palo Altos, said Scalar, Cato, Cisco, Juniper, VMware, Forcepoint, and Fortinet. Um, and this is just the beginning. Um, you know, what, what, what's next? Where, where do you see what's, what's emerging? What, where is this going to go in five years where 40% of organizations will have a SASE strategy in just four years time? Look, I think the biggest thing is probably going to be more adoption over the next couple of years. Um, the, the the great part for, at least from a Palo Alto standpoint, 
these are technologies that are not sort of that have been jimmied together as or, or cobbled together as you know a couple of different disparate solutions you know they are an integrated solution it's already sitting out in the cloud uh, we're in 76 different countries 100 different locations in each of those countries as well so if anything our I, I guess where the market is going to be heading over the next couple of years is really getting people on board uh, leveraging this first, first and foremost um, I think COVID, if anything, has probably accelerated the need for people to really live, leverage a lot of these cloud-delivered security services rather than relying on sort of capital investment of boxes that are actually physically sitting in different locations. Um, so if anything, it's just going to be more a case of getting people up and running. Uh, if I think about since we've actually, since SASE was announced, and obviously we've got a, a platform in that, um, in that sort of market segment, you know, we haven't sort of held back and sort of said well we've nailed everything it's more we're going to keep on adding more capabilities and you know and for us it's all about ensuring that we're delivering those security outcomes to our customers you know we saw that whilst we ticked boxes around SD-WAN capability we went out and acquired the leading SD-WAN solution that was 100% cloud delivered and that's all about ensuring that we can really deliver every single key piece that's really needed around SD-WAN so I think where the market is going to go, um, or at least from sort of our standpoint, is we're really just going to keep on adding more capabilities to the platform, make it even easier for people to consume it, uh, irrespective of the size of organization. But at the same time, it's making sure that adoption is high. They're leveraging all those different pieces that are out there. And every organization will be different point in time. Uh, you know, you may have some sort of secure web gateway solution today, but you've got other capabilities that are in SASE that you can retire Great. You know, you can still adopt SASE today and start to turn on those capabilities in the future because at the end of the day, it's a cloud delivered service. So that functionality, you could simply turn on in the future, but nothing precludes you from actually turning it on today. So I think big thing is getting people on board and, and adopting the capabilities where I see things sort of moving over the next year to five years. All right. And your your confidence in, in Gartner's prediction of 40% of organizations adopting or having a strategy for SASE in 2024 is that are you you know you in agreement with that? Absolutely, I think that's probably a, a good sort of number to sort of work with because even if you think about you know even if what you said at the start of the call about sort of the, the acquisitions that vendors are actually making you know that that's really driven by market forces. Um, people are buying a lot of these independent uh, individual point product solutions, but we also know that there's a lot of point solutions that people have already got today. Uh, I'm, 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 glad, I'm glad you said it was driven by market my, by market uh, pre pressures rather than than vendor pre pressures because yeah, 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 uh, we, we on occasion do see see vendors come out with uh, this is the best thing for you um, whereas this one seems to like you say very much more market driven as in uh, we need to solve this problem how we're going to do it so 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 my was... sorry go on. No, I was just going to say, and, and this is the thing that uh, you sort of you caught out at the start as well, Mark. It's just we, we've had these challenges for a long time. It, it's not a case of oh, one day it'd be nice if we could do it. It's like time is now. Yeah, yeah. So, so my kind of wish list for for uh, and it's more of a wish list than a, than a prediction, I guess. I'd, I'd like to see more interoperability between different, you know, maybe different platforms, different providers. So, so you have movement you can have movement between providers without too much pain um you know the, the the good providers will always float to the top so so that's fantastic but making that transition easier I, I see that happening in the next few years um you know phil mentioned at the start that there's a whole bunch of vendors uh now acquiring some of that technology so at the moment you know some of the technologies are still quite disparate whereas over the next three to uh, three to five years I, I see that converging into a whole, you know holistic solution and I'm like I said I'm kind of looking forward to the day where I can click a button and have a secure environment spun up for me to do what I needed to do so. good thank you now let's go and uh, we, we did receive a few questions up front and those of you uh, listening if you have any questions um, start forming those in the uh, in the questions box, if you would, of the um, of the webinar control panel. But uh, of, of an initial question that came from the field previously: How is SASE relevant if an organization is cloud native and has no network? We're going to use Sean first to respond. I think if uh, more, more than ever, you probably would need it uh, because if everything's in the cloud, you're definitely going to need a way to, uh, to secure what you're doing in the cloud. So absolutely, it's relevant. Uh, to an organization like that. 
Yeah, the 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 zero trust component or, or the trust component is is certainly the, the the more important element there, and you know identifying your users who are consuming those cloud native environments that that's going to be a key in, in this kind of uh, situation. But realistically, I, I guess there's no real difference, and that's the whole point of the SASE platform. There's no real difference between an application running internally as opposed to being a a cloud-based application, you approach it the same way, the security is the same, you still got the security around the uh, the, the data. And, and, and I guess, you know, at this point, there's differing um, levels of cloud adoption, but I hear, you know, we're now getting 60, 70, 80% of organizations moving their workloads to, you know, public and, and hybrid clouds. Is that is that congruent with what you believe, what you're seeing? Yeah, I, th I think so. I mean, we are... Uh, I'm I'm kind of too old, I guess. Um, <laughs> I, I've I've seen things centralized, decentralized, move to cloud, move back to cloud, move to private cloud, move to public cloud, move back in house, and things like that. So so different organisations are in different parts of those those channels. So, you know, this kind of approach of protecting your data folds nicely around wherever the data is. So it doesn't really matter. Uh, yeah, and and I think that's important. So I'm quite excited about all of this. The fact that we are starting to get the protection closer to data as opposed to, you know, the fence. And, and correct me if I'm wrong, Sean, a compatibility with the, you know, the, the three big cloud providers, is is that something that Palo has adopted as, as the method by which they'll deliver this? It doesn't matter what the cloud platform or where the data is that, that you're, you're compatible with it? Absolutely. Uh, it's, it's kind of agnostic to that. So from our standpoint, we would pretty much see um, you know, you, however you're going to sort of be accessing those cloud service providers or even just the, the cloud applications, the SaaS applications that are actually out there, um, you know, it, it's kind of agnostic to us. We, we want you to actually sort of access anything and everything you want, but do it in a secure way. And that's what it's all about. Right. Thank you. Um, that, that's good to hear that that, that that part is agnostic. So the next question from listeners, um, a bit of the same question, I think is a little more definition, um, but how will SASE work with an external hosted cloud service um, you know, directly connected to the internet, not via a VPC link. Is that we we discussed this yesterday, and what the what the customer was looking for here, or what the listener was listening looking for, Mark? Yeah. So so this one is is essentially the same question as as the previous one, a little bit. So so I kind of want to paraphrase it slightly. Is is maybe uh, a, an organization actually has a cloud based. Um, solution that is only accessible via VPC link. So there is no, no essentially no cloud exposed or publicly exposed cloud application. It is just a, a private link to a system, internal system essentially that happens to be posed, um, based in a cloud environment. But even then, the SASE platform, you know, it, it'll make no difference. It, it, it's defined, the protections are refined around the application. Okay, and then the last question that, that uh, has been you know, uh, sent in previously, um, and I think you mentioned this in particular, um, uh, Sean, you know, how does SASE fit into a zero trust strategy? Really important, high in the minds, uh, as Mark referenced as well. You know, core part to, um, to zero trust is really around sort of identity, you know, and SASE is really around that sort of identity-centric architecture. You know, it's understanding, defining a policy based on who you are, Phil, and you know what you can actually access. So that that's perfectly sort of fitting in, in right into that spot as to how you could start to sort of roll out a zero trust uh, strategy, leveraging a, a SASE solution. Okay, great. Now um, let's uh, let's move on to a quick poll, and then we'll come back and do rapid fire Q and A. We've received some questions, and any further questions, please send them through. Um, this next poll. Um, you know, we, we want to know if you believe that SASE is relevant to the organization that you're currently in. Um, you know, is it going to have a high impact, change business models um, in the design and planning and transformation stage? Are you interested in, and in, you know, want to do further investigation? Or to Sean's point, you know, should you, you know, turn it on and do a trial? Um, not relevant, and or you you don't have plans yet. Um, take a few seconds, if you would, respond to the poll. Again, the results will be out in just a moment. Uh, with you. But we'll come back with a rapid fire QA next. And 
We're almost back. We're just waiting for that last question. Someone is waiting on the button. Don't make it too hard. Good. So let's let's go to some questions that have been coming coming from listeners, if we could, Sean and uh, Mark, if you would indulge us. We're going well on time. Um, the first question that has come up um, is, and I'll just read it out to you here: Can SASE replace CASB, or do we need both? And and Sean, why don't you jump in, and then Mark follow? Yeah. Uh, yes, it would. So if you think about from what the, the CASB sort of offers, um, that capability is actually included into um, SASB platform. So uh, uh, speaking obviously from the Palatine Network solution, absolutely. So that capability is actually natively uh, part of the solution that we actually have today. So uh, your existing solution, you could basically retire that one. And even if it was a case of uh, let's say for argument's sake you've only just acquired a CASB solution but you've got some other ones you could easily still roll out a SASE solution today uh, and then turn on that sort of future CASB capability uh, in the future when it actually comes time to uh, to retire your existing one but absolutely you could sort of uh, incorporate that all as one big sort of SASE uh, offering. All right um, and and uh, your view CASB or CASB light? Uh, essentially, SASE will replace the CASB solution right. that you may have in place already, or ideally, of course, they'll work together into that platform so you're not not necessarily throw away existing investment that oh. you might have. Okay. Uh, but the capability is expected in the SASE platform because that's one of the whole points. What okay. applications, where's the? Where's it going? Where's it communicating? All right, there's the next question. It's, it's a lengthy one, so uh, to follow me here, and we'll do the best we can. Um, the question from the listener is, I have a client that is looking to execute a SASE strategy for Crown Jewels assets. Some of these assets are legacy systems with business processes where external suppliers require access and are adverse to requirements to implement multi-factor authentication, let alone a requirement to implement an endpoint agent. Any tips on how to design and implement a SASE for such use cases? It's a uh, yeah. multi multi point question. Um, it sounds like okay. a zero trust uh, policy yeah. is really yeah. what that really was because that's looking at you know what is it that you're actually trying to achieve. So kind of what's the, what's the business outcome you're looking to do? It's protect the crown jewels. Uh, you know where does it come from? Who is actually accessing it? You you want to leverage the multi factor authentication piece. You've got third party supplier. So you're looking at a different network. You want to be able to inspect and control. And then ultimately log all of that. So that's effectively kind of the, the zero trust networking aspect um, that's included in SASE. All right. That, that, that's kind of where I was going. I, I had a much more flippant answer in the back of my head, of course, uh, <laughs> as, as I usually do. I mean, if it's an external supplier that requires access and they're not playing your game, then, then my flippant answer would be find a different supplier, uh, but that's obviously not always possible. So, so that's that's not a reality. But I definitely echo Sean's. You know, it's a zero trust uh, um, question. You can build that around it. Uh, for legacy applications, you may need to you know plug something in front of it uh, to to kind of protect that asset and reverse it into it. But there are some different solutions around that uh, can help you with that. Okay, so um, moving on, the next question, um, and, and it's less of a question, I, I think it's a statement, network plus security as one hardware. Um, and, and I believe this is what we refer to as the convergence aspect. The follow-up question to that is, is probably, are we talking about integration at a hardware level? Um, you know, you've referred to throughout the presentation, you know, it, in this being SaaS enabled and Cloud enabled is is there a hardware component to this? So, so SASE is all about. I'm yeah, sorry, go, go for it. Man. You go first. No, no, no you, you, go for it. you go. You go first. <laughs> because mine is pure speculation. <laughs> yeah, go for it. So I guess the requirements, let's just say that the requirement of what Gartner has called out in terms of what makes up a SASE solution uh, is really around the fact of it being cloud native and a cloud based service delivery model. Um, so having a box and calling that SASE isn't really a, a SASE based solution. Uh, that sounds more like sort of the Swiss Army knife approach of a, a solution which really won't uh, necessarily sort of solve a lot of those challenges. It probably may meet a lot of the requirements around some of the key aspects, 
uh, but it, in terms of really delivering itself as a, um, you know, all networks, all edges, last time I checked, you can't actually drop a box off in uh, AWS or, uh, or Azure or a GCP data center. So that's where it's going to make life a little bit harder yeah. for you. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking at that question slightly differently. So yeah. I, I, I'm looking at it slightly differently. The, the, there is a, um, a way of thinking where zero trust kind of defined down to its, its core levels is, is actually goes a bit further than what we are currently implementing as an industry uh, at this particular stage. So it's actually looking at, um, you know, if I trust the hardware, I can trust and I, and I have a strong process around identifying the user of that particular hardware, then I'm trusting the user on that particular hardware if that's then connected to a network then which I trust then. So it's building up those different levels of trust and it's, a, it's actually a thought process that's coming out of Intel where they're actually trying to build a, a level of trust into the chip in the first place and in the chip, into the motherboard, into the machine, into the, the identification, into the network, into the application, et cetera. Um, it, it, it's it's an interesting way of thinking. Uh, I, I actually suspect it's doomed to fail <laughs> in, in the end as uh, various vulnerabilities on Intel chips over the last couple of years have demonstrated. Uh, but that's kind of where it's going. So the, the quick answer to that, are we talking about integration at hardware level? No, we're not talking at that at that particular level. Uh, will there be components on endpoints and end user machines that provide mm -hmm. a level of integrity for that machine and a level of confidence that the you know the user is real, et cetera? Uh, that will likely be part of it. Thank you, Mark. Now we understand why you're the, the chief technology officer. We got deep deep and technical there, I appreciate that. Down to the chip <laughs> level, took us all the way through to the network component and trust. Um, this next question, this is interesting, what problem are we trying to solve? Does Microsoft Office 365 EMS E5 licensing address network and security requirements? What's the gap? So uh, I think that's a challenge out to you, to you Sean, is, is Microsoft Office 365 EMS, um, you know, gonna gonna solve the, the same, same outcomes as, uh, as a sassy Palo Alto, uh, you know, Prisma Access. Yeah, I guess the challenge is going to be uh, what other applications are using. Um, the the limited there is a limited scope in terms of the number of applications that Microsoft looks at today, um, and it really sort of and, and broadens itself out from there as well. So that's where it really comes down to what else you're going to be using inside your environment. If you're a hundred percent Microsoft homogenous network, sure that would probably work. But I guess you're going to start to think about how does that really sort of scale out. Um, but then also put it through its paces and see what else is actually out there. But today, what's there kind of like for like, and even sort of looking at a couple of other vendor solutions as well, uh, it, it's going to be limited in, in terms of what it can deliver uh, as, a, as an offering compared to uh, other SASE solutions there today. And, and, and don't forget, Microsoft Focus is Microsoft World, right? So yeah. one of the things that they don't have anything for is, uh, I don't believe at least anyway, is that software-defined networking component and the, the SD-WAN component that, that many SASE solutions will bring to the picture as well. So you won't get that. Uh, you will get some of the other components that are typically part of that SASE model as part of the E5 environment. Of course. Well, thank you. Hopefully that answers the, the listener's question. This is our last question in the rapid fire. Um, as a, a, a SaaS provider, I'm trying to envision the best starting point for consuming this service. So I think this goes back to our, our transition. Uh, and, and I believe, you know, we'd recommend that it, it's the trial. Is that right? Yeah, definitely. Um, right. You know, put it in places, I think is always going to be the best way. Uh, looking at brochure and sort of comparing things uh, as a paper-based evaluation doesn't really sort of work out. Uh, I think put it in your own environment and see what it looks like. Terrific. Thanks. Thanks very much. Um, let's uh, wrap it up. Let's give you a few more, a few minutes left here. Um, the uh, I want to I want to thank everybody for uh, staying with us this morning and and attending um, and and uh, participating in uh, today's session. The poll results. Let's. Um, Let's take a quick look, look at the results. So, you know, clearly I'm learning about SASE. So we, I think we have, Sean and, and Mark really want to thank you because we are, um, we've identified the, the opportunity to educate and make people aware, you know, in the majority of, of learning about SASE for the first time uh, or upskilling. And so I think we achieved our goal today. Thanks very much. Um, 
and how familiar. And then the next uh, poll question was, uh, how relevant is SASE to your organization? You know, clearly, um, you know, 8% do see it as, as uh, changing the way the business operates. Um, a high percentage then, you know, about a quarter percent uh, will change the way we design and secure networks. And, and then number three, you know, that in that in that lead position, SASE is interesting and warrants further investigation. So I think we really have achieved uh, what we want, what we set out to do is, and you'll hear more from us uh, uh, in the future. So um, thanks for enjoying, you know, thanks for participating. If you wouldn't mind, please complete the survey at the end of the discussion uh, and uh, send through, you know, any, any thoughts and ideas you'd like to see next. If you'd like us to go deeper, on this technology and the framework, you know, please let us know uh, in, in back here in uh, in in the uh, dialogue series. Um, everybody will record, will get a a link to the recording so they they can play back and questions will appear on the Sire dialogue page. Now, I want to thank uh, Sean Duca, Vice President of Palo Alto Networks here in Asia Pac, and Mark Hoffman, the CTO at CyberCX. And I want to thank everybody for attending. Have a good day. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Ralph.